Hello, Booktube. Oh, what's the matter, baby? What you doing? Huh? What you doing? Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, I'm once again taking a break from uh, from just nose to the grindstone writing. Uh, a ninja deadline cropped up in my life, not on my own work docket, but on a, the work docket of a friend uh, who's up against the wall and there's a large amount of money riding on the line and uh, my rates are good because I'm free and also my end product is good because I'm fast and my prose is clean. So I've got a lot of extra writing to do and that means I can't just sit down and do a block of videos. Wish I could. Uh, but I can't, so I'm just sort of popping in and out whenever I need a break, not to stretch my legs because exercise is overrated, but but to stretch my mental legs uh, and make a video with you. So I'm doing that now, but I don't know how many more times I'm going to be able to do that today, uh, and this afternoon and evening are, are out. They're completely out of the question. I would imagine they're completely out of the question. So I wanted to do, uh, for this video, New Arrivals. Something as vague as new arrivals, just so we can encompass everything. Uh, these are, I think, mostly new books, uh, with the exception of the first book, which was a gift from one of you that had me chuckling for hours. This is by Kenneth Von Gunden, and it's Canine Core. <laughs> uh, mankind's best friends and the future's greatest heroes. They are the best freelance space scouts in the galaxy. Genetically altered dogs with enhanced senses and the gift of speech. They are Beowulf, Grendel, Mamasan, Anson, Ozma, Little John, Frodo, Sinbad, and Pandora. And they will stand beside Ray Larkin, their human leader, against any danger, anywhere, at any cost. They are the Canine Corps. <laughs> uh, one of you must have found this at a used bookstore. Uh, it's from 1991, and the note, the note is really nice. I want to read you just one part of it. Uh, the, the dog species has been changed to protect the innocent, because obviously it should be miniature schnauzers, and the man's name has been changed to protect the guilty. <laughs> I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I have the best viewers anywhere on YouTube. So if you're watching and you sent me this, thank you very, very much. <laughs> it's a bullseye. Uh, but we have a bunch of new stuff, too. New-ish stuff. Uh, this next thing, for instance, uh, doesn't come out until October, no, December. This comes out in December, but it's a cause for joy. This is the new John Straley. Uh, this is uh, So Far and Good with one of the best covers I'm likely to see this year. Those are prison inmates. There's barbed wire here. Those are pres prison inmates. They've got the guard tower right there, but you've also got a thousand pound grizzly bear just looking at them because these take place in Alaska. Uh, and they star uh, Cecil Younger, who's, who's in prison. Uh, and they're fantastic. The Denver Post, yeah, the Denver Post is quoted up here as saying, Straley has done the impossible. He's reinvented the private eye novel. And ordinarily that would be just so much humbug, but it really is true. These, John Straley is not to be missed. No matter what, he is not to be missed. His books are fantastic. Not only unexpected and interesting, but also beautifully written. They're just beautifully written. Uh, I, the one that sticks in my mind is not a Cecil Younger book, right? Cecil Younger is the woman who married a bear, curious eat themselves, the music of what happens, death and the language of happiness, angels will not care, cold water burning, baby's first felony, which is incredible. Baby's first felony is an amazing book. Uh, and then this one, so far and good. Uh, but the other books that this author has written uh, in both, in the big both ways, cold storage Alaska, and also what is time to a pig, which we saw on this channel a couple of years ago, and which was absolutely incredible. Just incredible. Uh, and this is a, a new Cecil Younger. Let me see. What, what have we got here? This comes out in uh, uh, the first week of December. Uh, the verdict from the three-judge panel is in. Cecil Younger, bumbling criminal defense investigator and totally embarrassing father, has been sentenced to seven and a half years in prison for his involvement in, well, a number of things, ranging from the destruction of private property to killing a guy. Uh, but compared to the original 25-year sentence, it's not so bad. His success with getting his sentence reduced has attracted the attention of his fellow inmates, and one man called Fourth Street reaches out for advice on his upcoming parole hearing in exchange for protection and companionship. Uh, Cecil tells us at the beginning of his book that he had the, the single longest allocution in court in Alaskan history, and that reduced his sentence uh, from 25 years to, to, to uh, just a handful. 
Uh, when he isn't reading James Baldwin with 4th Street, Cecil spends his time filling up a, a large yellow legal pads. He writes mostly about his teenage daughter, Blossom, who is on a Nancy Drew-like quest to help her friend, George, discover the truth about her biological parents, which turns out to be complicated. Shortly after submitting a mail-in genetics test, George learns she is the infamous baby Jane Doe, who was kidnapped from her native mother shortly after she was born. A media and legal circus quickly ensues, and George's reunion with her birth family isn't the heartwarming story the journalist hoped it would be. There's an even darker secret about the baby-snatching case, the secret that threatens to destroy not only George's family, but Cecil's as well. And keep in mind, he's in prison during this novel. And uh, I... This is any new book by this author is a cause for celebration. If you are a murder mystery fan, keep keep in mind we're dealing with subgenre September uh, as a spin-off event of March Mystery Madness all throughout the month of September. And if if you are a fan of murder mystery series and you somehow manage to miss Cecil Younger, somehow manage to miss John Straley just at all, whether it's a Cecil Younger book or not, you should rectify that because these are terrific, terrific books. Not quite like anything else you've ever read. Uh, I got a refresher course because the great folks at Soho Press, uh, when I got What is Time to a Pig, I said, is there any chance that you could maybe get the warehouse to send me a couple of the earlier books? And they sent me all of them. So I, I just had I just had a ball rereading in one huge binge all of these things. They're just so good. So put this author on your radar. Absolutely. That's for December. Uh, then we have a slightly older book. This is from uh, March of 2020, so it's probably out in paperback now, or coming out in paperback now. Uh, I went back to it because of uh, obvious relevance with, the, with today's news. This is by uh, Joseba Zuleika, and it's called From Hellfire from Paradise Ranch, On the Front Lines of Drone Warfare, uh, which is all over the news because the... You know, the forensics of American involvement in Afghanistan have only just begun. And that's what this is about. It exposes the terror and warfare of drone killings that dominate our modern military. It unveils the trauma drone operators experience, in part due to their visual intimacy with their victims, and explores the resistance to drone killings in some apocalyptic Nevada desert where nuclear testing, pacific, pacifist militancy, and Shoshone traditions overlap. Uh, I'm just enough of a product of the early, of the late 1950s and the early 1960s, when of course I had not yet been born. But I'm just a product enough of those to say that I don't give two rips in a pan for the emotional trauma of drone operators. Okay, I don't give two rips in a pan about that because we're talking about American drone operators here. They're not. We're not. When that that line is not referring to drone operators a acting at the behest of their superiors in the People's Republic of China. We're talking about drone operators who could let visual intimacy is absolutely true. We're talking about American drone operators who could see that the putative target of their attack, on whom the intelligence was sketchy at best, was at a wedding surrounded by innocent people. And they went ahead with it anyway. They went ahead with it anyway. And if you say, well, of course they went ahead with it anyway, the alternative would be that they'd be fired. You really need to take a long break from social media and maybe talk with a priest, because that is monstrous. I am sure I'm not attacking you. I'm sure that's an accurate reflection of what some of those drone operators said. Well, it's either do this or lose my job. That's monstrous. It's either kill a wedding party or lose my job. So I'm, I really don't care two farts in a pan about the emotional trauma of the people who did these crimes. Uh, but I do. I, I did read this when it first came out and thought it was really, really good. Kind of a, a minor key non-fiction classic of the 21st century, of a very dark kind. Uh, so it's on my mind to read again, absolutely. Uh, then this next one is uh, new. I think it's out already, but it's it's very recent. Uh, and it's an author that I have not liked. Uh, and uh, like a lot of you, I take my cues for what to visit or revisit, for what to take seriously, from the Fiction Chronicle written by, what's his name? Sam Sachs? The Wall Street Journal. Now, the Fiction Chronicle is is prohibitively paywalled, uh, but it's worth it. Uh, it's, the Wall Street Journal is not just for David Murphy. <laughs> there, there's plenty of great books coverage. Uh, and he likes this book. I wasn't disposed to like it, so I'm going to give it a try. And it's this, The War for Gloria by Attica, Atticus Lish. Really uh, unusual American cover design that I rather like. 
uh, about a, a woman and her son in uh, the orbit of Boston. Corey Goltz, G-O-L-T-Z, grows up in the working class outskirts of Boston as the only child of Gloria, whose ambitions were derailed early, but who has always given her son everything she can. Corey, restless, dreams of leaving home for a great adventure. Instead, when he's 15, the world comes crashing down on him. Gloria develops ALS. Uh, and too late, his estranged father, Leonard, a man of great charisma but dubious moral character, re-enters the picture. Determined to be his mother's hero at any cost, Corey begins shouldering responsibility for her expensive medical care, pushing himself to physical and emotional limits as, he, as her disease cruelly progresses. And it is, I don't know how much you know about ALS, but it is incredibly cruel. Uh, you are completely aware the whole time as you lose your body as you become 100% dependent on your caregivers. Uh, as Leonard's influence over Corey grows, Corey must dismantle the myth of his father's genius and confront the evil that lurks beneath it. Uh, and that, that particular uh, narrative structure there, the father coming back into the picture, the father being larger than life, the father having feet of clay, the father having uh, a dark, needy, sort of sordid underbelly, dimension to him that the that the now fully grown adult son has to excavate that has been done many 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 times in the last 15 years in contemporary american fiction including a quite a few times that i've really really enjoyed a novel named the chateau for instance does the same thing does it fantastically uh i'm looking forward to this i i uh, read a bit of it from i think net galley and was not impressed but uh, when a critic that you really that you really like points you towards something, you give it a try. <laughs> you you go at it again with an open mind. Uh, this next one is also new fiction. It's also uh, relatively brand new. I don't have a date on it. I don't have a slip in it. This is, I believe, a, a debut novel. It's by Jai Chakraborty, and it's called A Play for the End of the World. And here we have the, the hideous, ugly American cover. Uh, the, yeah, this is a debut novel set in the early 1970s in New York City and rural India. Uh, the setting at the beginning is New York City, 1972. Uh, Jarek Smith, a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto, and Lucy Gardner, a free-spirited Southerner who is newly arrived in the city, are the first are in the first bloom of love when they receive word that Jarek's oldest friend from childhood has died under mysterious circumstances in a village in eastern Turkey. In eastern India, sorry. Baby, again with the slurping. Why are you slurping? Uh, uh, traveling there alone to collect his friend's ashes, Jarek soon finds himself enmeshed in the chaos of local politics and efforts to stage a play in protest against the government. The same play, written by the revered Bengali author Rabindranath Tagore, that Jarek performed as a child in Warsaw as an act of resistance against the Nazis. The same play. A play for the end of the world. It's the same play in two radically different, uh, emotionally resonant places. Uh, torn between the survivor's guilt he has carried for decades and his feeling for Lucy, Jarek must decide how to honor both the past and the present, and how to accept the happiness he's not sure he deserves. Hideous cover or no hideous cover, I'm all for it. <laughs> Absolutely all for it. And it's a debut. So those are always fun. Uh, then this next one is YA. Uh, this is the, the third and concluding volume in a series that I read. I read the first one and loved it just loved it. And I don't think I ever got the second one. I don't think I, that I've, I'm not up on this series. I'm going to have to read the second one before I read this, this concluding volume. This is Tristan Strong Keeps Punching by Kwame Mbalia. Uh, and this is a sequel to, uh, do we have the, uh, do we list the first two books? Yes, the first book is Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky. And that was incredible. Absolutely incredible. Saturated with uh, African mythology saturated with uh, slave mythology, saturated with, uh, with the, the superstructure, uh, the fantasy superstructure at the back of this YA fantasy book. Tristan, Tristan Strong is a normal kid from our world. But the fantasy superstructure behind it, for once, is not beholden to Indo-European, Tolkien-esque stuff at all. And, and that, you know, that's not enough to save a book on its own, but it was written with such amazing energy and character that I loved it. But the second one is Tristan Strong Destroys the World, and I don't, I don't, I don't think I read that. I don't think I've ever seen it. Here are the uh, elaborate end papers there. Uh, and this is the concluding volume where our young hero is going to face his arch nemesis. 
Bryant at Bookish. <laughs> uh, after returning with Ayana, now see, I'm not 100% clear on Ayana. I'm assuming that's Ayana, but I'm, I'm going to need to read the second volume in the series here. Uh, Tristan travels up the Mississippi in pursuit of his arch enemy, King Cotton. Along the way, they encounter new haints who are dead, set on preventing their progress north to Tristan's hometown of Chicago. It's going to take many Alcaean friends, including the gods themselves, the black flames of the Afokena gloves, and all of Tristan's inner strength, to deliver justice once and for all. And I'm glad that the, uh, that the pub sheet makes mention of Tristan's inner strength, because that was the thing I loved the most about Tristan Strong punches a hole in the sky, is that Tristan Strong, as a character, was terrific. Just terrific. Uh, so, this is the third volume. Now that I, now that I hold it up, I'm thinking, uh, is it going to be worth my time to read this thing? Or should I, should I, I probably have the second volume here, somewhere. I should probably read that, because it's not ringing a bell at all. I don't think I read the second volume. Uh, but if if you're looking for a YA series that uh, is very different from the normal run and that has terrific characters, especially the main character, uh, then find, you know, at your library or at a thrift shop or whatever, find a copy of Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky and read it. You're going to love it. You're absolutely going to love it. And, you know, there's, a, there's another element that it works for. It's, not, it's an element I tend to deride on this channel rather than champion. Uh, which is the, what is stereotypically known in the 21st century as representation. Uh, I don't like it because, of course, it, as, as anybody who sits for even a second can figure, can figure out, it flies in the face of what we all do with reading, especially reading fiction, which is to put ourselves in different worlds, not to see our own self reflected right back at us. Nevertheless, uh, for, for, let's say, like, for instance, young boys are notoriously difficult to get interested in reading. The ones who, who stay interested right from the beginning and just go on for the rest of their lives, they're okay, they're fine. But there are plenty of boys, you know, 13, 14, 15, that's when they start to stop reading. That's when they start to think, uh, I don't know. And if, I could easily picture that if, for a lot of those young boys, if they were, if they were American and black, then Tristan Strong would be a thing to keep them reading. And that, that, that is never a bad thing. That is never, that is never a bad thing. I wouldn't be saying any of this if Tristan Strong weren't drawn as a three-dimensional fantastic character, but he is. So uh, there's that as well. But I, I recommend the first book in this series. Can't help but think the second two are going to be great. Uh, I'm just realizing belatedly here that I, I don't know that for sure because I haven't read the second one. I'm going to have to take care of that. Uh, then this next one is uh, Oceanic Archaeology. Mm -hmm. This is by Patrick Nunn, and it's called Worlds in Shadow, Submerged Lands in Science, Memory, and Myth. Uh, so not just Atlantis. Uh, the traces of much of human history and that which preceded it lie beneath the ocean surface, broken up, dispersed, often buried, and always mysterious, and on top of all of that, often completely inaccessible. As as plates, as continental plates, subduct underneath each other, underneath each other, and underneath hundreds of millions of tons of water, that's corrosive, the salt water that has currents that are scouring things away, a huge amount of uh, paleological and archaeological history is just gone, gone beyond repair. It has literally been crushed into atoms underneath the surface of the earth. Uh, lies beneath the ocean surface, broken up, dispersed, often buried, and always mysterious. This is fertile ground for speculation, even myth-making, but also a topic on which geologists and climatologists have increasingly focused in recent decades. We now know enough to tell the true story of some of the continents and islands that have disappeared throughout Earth's history to explain how and why such things happen and to unravel the effects of submergence on the rise and fall of human civilization. In this book, the author sifts fact from fiction. You notice the ghost haunting all of this is Atlantis. Uh, Looking for descriptions of recently drowned lands that have been well documented, those that are plausible, and those that belong to the realm of imagination, the author uses the latest geological research to help establish which of folklore's submerged landscapes are likely to actually exist. To have actually existed. Again, we're not talking. We're not. <laughs> Atlantis is not being mentioned. Atlantis was made up by Plato. So it is one of the mythological ones. <laughs> okay, Edgar Casey, notwithstanding. It's one of the mythological ones. Uh, anyway, going even further back, 
Patrick examines the presence of more ancient lands, submerged beneath the waves in a time that even the longest-reaching folk memory can't touch. Such places may have played an important roles in human evolution, but can only be reconstructed through careful geological detective work. The mention of geological detective work is what makes me interested in this book. Uh, exploring how lands become submerged, whether from sea level changes, tectonic changes, gravity collapse, uh, giant waves, or volcanoes, helps us determine why, when, and where land may disappear in the future and what might be done to prevent it. Uh, one, I don't know about the rest of you, but once I reached a certain age, I became intimately familiar with gravity collapse. <laughs> and then the last thing for those new arrivals here is an actual new arrival. It's actually in its envelope. I thought we'd, we'd open it together and see here. I don't know what kind of a, of a, a mail haul otherwise we're going to have today, but we see what we have here. It feels like a finished copy. Yes, okay, it is a finished copy. Great. This is the new Steven Pinker, Rationality. What it is why it seems scarce, and why it matters. This is Steven Pinker's new book. Uh, I have a fraught relationship with this author. He is the author of... Uh, uh, what was the name of the book? Uh, he wrote The Language Instinct, of course, which is the reason that you'll know him. But he also wrote a book a few years ago that just had me my jaw hanging open the whole time I was reading it. Uh, yeah, the Better Angels of Our Nature. In The Better Angels of Our Nature, Steven Pinker who lives in a gated community and teaches at Harvard University and always will do both of those things until he dies, a very peaceful death, uh, surrounded by freshly cut flowers, the hired help, and the, his, his loving family. Uh, in The Better Angels of Our Nature, Stephen Pinker says that the world's getting better and better. Uh, violence is on the drastic decrease, uh, uh, human compassion and rationality are on the increase, uh, and that, that, that is the reason, that the, the world is getting less and less violent because humans are getting better and better. I am, I'm overcome with a wave of simple, jaw-dropped disbelief, even reciting the conclusions of Better Angels of Our Nature. And yet, huge swaths of the intellectual world took it straight to heart. Well, if this frizzy, white-haired Harvard guy is saying this, it must be true. When it self-evidently is not true. It's one of the rare instances where an author this smart bases a, an entire book on a premise that is self-evidently false. <laughs> Where not, not, not that you, you only disprove his thesis with the, the same amount of research that he has done, where you dig into the weeds and you're reading the, you know, the untranslated French excerpts of some scientific article and suddenly it dawns on you. No, you just have to have eyes, a news feed, and a brain in your head to know that the whole premise of the better angels of our nature is self-evidently false. Uh, but... This author has also done lots of things that I like, uh, and I'm hoping that this will be one of them. I am commissioned to review this book, so I, it, it jumps right to the head of the line. I wish it could jump all the way to the head of the line, uh, but it can't. No reading can. Most of my day is going to be spent on writing, uh, and not my own writing either. I got, I, I got a little bit of fun out of my system yesterday on Open Letters Review by writing a review of Beautiful World, Where Are You? by Sally Rooney. I told myself, well, the reason why you should do this, apart from the fact that you are now, you're, you, as soon as you're done, you're going to submerge 48 hours into writing that's not particularly interesting to you. But uh, apart from that reason, the reason why you should review that book at length for your own journal uh, is so that at least there's one dissenting voice out there in the world. It is possible, if people want to, I don't do a very good job publicizing Open Letters Review, but it is possible, if people want to, uh, to find my review of Sally Rooney. And it will be the only one like it that you read. <laughs> the chorus will be absolutely unanimous, except for me. And I wanted that to be true. I want there to be at least a dissenting voice out there from a, an, an off-blurbed, working, professional critic. Uh, and I would love to be able to do that again. I would love to be able to read this and just launch right away into the review, but I'm not going to be able to do that. So uh, I'm glad to have it, but it's going to have to wait. Uh, and there you go. Th those are our new arrivals. Kind of a nebulous term, but it gets me through there. We have Rationality by Stephen Pinker, the new Stephen Pinker. We have Worlds in Shadow, about worlds buried under the waves. Uh, we have Tristan Strong Keeps Punching, uh, a dumb title, but... Uh, the conclusion of what I imagine to be a very good trilogy. Uh, we have a, a play for the end of the world, 
a debut novel set in New York and India. We have The War for Gloria by Atticus Lish, which I have been told by those who know, uh, may very well be put, positioning this author for a higher realm of being taken seriously. This might, that this book might be the thing that makes him a major author. Uh, then we have uh, Hellfire from Paradise Ranch, uh, an older book about uh, U.S. drone warfare. And finally, So Far and Good by the great John Straley, a murder mystery novelist that you really have to find. You really should be aware of this guy. Uh, so there you go. Uh, those are, uh, oh, and also, <laughs> and also Canine Core. <laughs> Those are uh, some new releases for your Friday. Uh, and I have to go. <laughs> I cannot indulge in these videos. I have to go, but I will be back as soon as I can. Thank you, BookTube.